All right, we have started the recording and we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everyone to our briefing today, serving those who serve barriers to infertility care for service members and veterans. I am uh, the moderator for this uh, amazing panel today. My name is Barb Kulora, and I'm the president and CEO of Resolve, the National Infertility Association. So why are we here? Why are we doing this briefing? Well, for many years, um, a lot of us have been advocating for people in the military and for our veterans to have the right to build a family. Uh, we have, you'll hear about some of that legislation that we've advocated for, but um, it's very much part of Resolve's DNA where we want really everyone who has the desire to build a family, has the means to do that, has access to the care that they need, and that that is covered um, in, in many cases by insurance coverage. What we have found though, is that there are many barriers there's many barriers in the private sector. There's also many barriers in, in um, plans provided by our federal government. And there are tremendous barriers for our veterans and for our active duty and retiree service members in their quest to build a family. So today we're gonna unpack that. We're gonna explore that. We're gonna look at um, why that is, what some of those barriers may be. And then we're gonna hopefully end on a high note with um, some recommendations on what we all need to do to get us to that place where everyone um, can have access to care and be able to build their family. So I'm gonna um, introduce our panelists. We have a lot to cover in an hour. We are gonna leave time at the end for Q&A. You can put your questions into the chat feature, not the Q&A, but into the chat. And we have uh, someone who's helping us go through those questions. Again, we will get to those at the end and I'm excited to um, move us through. Let's just see if we've got everybody here. Yes, we do. Hi, Ryan. All right. Okay. Let me go ahead and um, get us to our um, panelists, but let me just um, thank our hosts for today's webinar, the Center for Reproductive Rights. Um, I'm with Resolve and then the Service Women's Action Network. We're um, incredibly grateful for CRR and SWAN for um, helping us with the content and um, thinking through this, uh, this webinar and briefing today and making it really the best that we possibly can. So let me jump right in and introduce our panelists and then we'll, we'll start with our, um, with our remarks and move right through. Um, we, first of all, we have an amazing panel. These are um, really some of the top experts in our country on this issue, and I'm delighted that they all could make it today. Sarah Dean is with the Democratic Professional Staff on the Subcommittee on Health in uh, the House on Veterans Affairs Committee. We're really excited to have Sarah and her expertise here with us today. Carrie uh, Carwin is with the U.S. Coast Guard Retired. Uh, she's going to tell us a little bit about her own personal journey, and she's also a volunteer with the Service Women's Action Network. Also joining us is Ryan um, Pettit. He is with Senator Murray's office. He's been working on this issue for many, many years. He's a senior advisor for national security and really an expert on this topic. Um, joining us from the front lines of delivering that care to, to veterans and service members is Dr. Ginny Ryan. Uh, Dr. Ryan is a reproductive endocrinologist. Uh, in other words, she's a fertility doctor, and she's just moved to University of Washington Medical Center. She was recently at University of Iowa and um, can give us um, her sense of what's going on on the front lines. And then also joining us is Carla Therese. Carla is with the Center for Reproductive Rights. She's a senior human rights counsel. I've had the pleasure of working with Carla on this um, topic and, and, and putting this briefing together. And so Carla, I'm gonna start with you. We are here today because of an issue brief that CRR put out called Serving Those Who Serve, Access to IVF, for service members and veterans. So tell me, why did the Center for Reproductive Rights do this issue brief? Sure, thank you, Barb. It's nice to be here with everyone else. 
So the center published this issue brief um, for a few reasons. First, we advocate for equitable access access to infertility care, including IVF for everyone without discrimination. And initially our work focused on the civilian population where we found disparities in both incidence rates and in rates of access to care based on a variety of factors, including race, income, marital status, sexual orientation and disability. And very quickly we realized that some of the disparities that we were seeing in the general population were also mirrored in the military context. Second, we produced this issue brief in collaboration with the Service Women's Action Network with SWAN, uh, which had recently published a survey of 799 female service members access to reproductive health care services, including infertility care. And what their survey reported was that a staggering 37% of their respondents had experienced or were experiencing infertility. And that's notable because it's over three times higher than the reported national average, which is approximately 12%. Um, so our partnership with SWAN was critical, their findings were critical, and so were the stories that they collected, which really helped to illustrate the barriers that we had identified in our issue brief. And then finally, this issue brief was one in a series of briefs that we, the center published on service members and veterans access to reproductive healthcare services, including on access to abortion and access to contraception. And my colleagues and I really thought it was important to acknowledge that people who are pregnant, people who need access to abortion, to contraception, to infertility care, to become pregnant, oftentimes are the same person. And that person needs all of these types of healthcare services at different times of their life. And so we wanted to situate infertility and access to infertility care along this continuum of a person's reproductive life. Now, Carla, I know we're going to get into your recommendations at the end of this presentation, but is there anything that you want to just point out right now in terms of what you learned as you put this issue brief together? Sure. Yeah, we, I mean, we learned a lot. Um, we learned most glaringly that service members, veterans, and their families face severe restrictions in accessing infertility care, including IVF, and that these barriers to care um, are not just policy barriers, but they're also financial, logistical, and institutional ones. Um, I'll focus on one of the more um, glaring ones, which is that TRICARE, which is the Military Health Insurance Program, doesn't provide coverage for IVF except under very narrow circumstances. So to be eligible for coverage, a service member must be on active duty, be injured or have experienced a serious illness while on active duty, lose their natural reproductive ability because of said injury or illness, be able to provide their own genetic material and have a spouse who can also provide their own genetic material. And I'll note that these eligibility requirements are also mirrored in the Veterans Health Administration system and so apply to veterans and their families. Obviously, as written and applied, these requirements exclude anyone who, for example, cannot prove that their infertility is service related, cannot provide their own genetic material, um, anyone who is unmarried, or anyone who's in a same sex partnership. And here I'll note two things. One is that up to 30% of couples who are unable to achieve pregnancy are diagnosed with unexplained infertility. Um, so sometimes it's really, it's difficult or impossible to pinpoint what exactly is causing your infertility, your clinical infertility. I'll also note that in the services, 16% of women and 4% of men are identified as LGBTQ and are considered socially infertile. And by that, I mean um, infertility or infertile based on, not on physiological conditions, but are on social conditions. For example, being single or being in a same sex partnership. So the requirements that are made of service members and veteran, veterans eligibility requirements are exclusive of, of many of them. Um, and, and these eligibility requirements force many of them into the private insurance market uh, to pay out of pocket for needed care or sadly to forego it. Um, and, and this is because as we all know, IVF can, is really costly and can, can cost up to upwards of $20,000 per cycle. And often multiple cycles are needed to achieve a pregnancy. Um, you know, I'll also note 
a couple of other barriers that we identified that might be covered by other speakers. One is that there are only six military treatment facilities that offer the full range of infertility care, including IVF. And because of this limited number of facilities and the high demand for infertility care, there are wait times of up to one year, and that is not uncommon. And as we all know, infertility access to infertility care is time sensitive. Um, these, uh, there are also failures to refer, as well as referrals to limited um, service providers, including religious institutions that do not offer IVF and may even fail to mention IVF as an option for their patients. Um, you know, all of these barriers alone, but especially in aggregate, make access to infertility care, including IVF, inaccessible, unaffordable, and discriminatory. And so, you know, it was, it was really learning about all of these barriers. It was, it was really galvanizing to put this issue brief together and to share it with, with others who might be able to do something with it. Yeah, I feel like Carla, you've you've laid on us a, a whole torrent of, of barriers and reasons um, why it's so difficult, but that's what we're here to talk about. So you did a great job of summarizing that. I'm gonna now turn to Carrie and Carrie, let's put um, let's put a face to this. Let's really let our listeners understand how this impacts somebody um you know in their in their day-to-day -day life so um if you if you can um i'd love for you to share with us um your story about accessing care and the barriers that you encountered thank you barb um and carla thank you it was a great segue into this because i came up with 10 specific barriers and uh, the first one was availability of services which is you touched upon uh, really well concerning policy and then the physical access to clinics so with a six dod uh, facilities, there is no mechanism within personnel management or within work life to get you stationed near one of those. I think the closest I got with it was in a five hour drive. Um, and then I was 38 years old at the time and they wouldn't take somebody that was over 37. So it, there's that discrimination also, not just the single, whether you're same sex, but my age um, also had played a part. Um, IVF is considered elective, uh, same category as uh, breast augmentation or tummy tuck. I have polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is a medical condition. So I guess they consider that I electively gave myself a medical condition. And because it's elective, I had to take leave in order to attend medical appointments because um, <clears throat> it wasn't recognized. There's also the cost. Uh, there's no grants for IVF. Uh, we talked about insurance. There is something if I want to get adoption and I want to adopt someone else's child, um, but there's no financial help for me to uh, do it myself to, through IVF. And uh, DOD facilities reduce the cost, but it still costs upwards of $7,000, which obviously impacts junior personnel and folks that don't have necessarily the uh, funds to pay for treatments. The medication that we take for the treatments is very expensive. Um, some of it has to be refrigerated, uh, specialized. It requires time shots and the reimbursement for buying the medication is very, very slow. So if you're on a limited budget and you wanna do more than one cycle or round or, or something like that, that you financially are gonna be pressed up against that. Um, that also goes into deploying and standing duty. So because I was a emergency response individual in my service, uh, it made it very hard to plan. Obviously, I can't plan for emergencies. So this process takes weeks, if not months, from start to finish. And I was in the middle of a treatment. And because it's an elective and I'm doing this on my own out of pocket, there was nothing to preclude me from being deployed somewhere. And that is exactly what happened during one of my treatments. I was already starting a cycle round and I had leave scheduled for the actual retrieval, um, not having enough leave to take the entire time. And I ended up having to deploy to Texas and to do shots in a rental car because I'm in the field and no IVF doctor I've talked to has said, hey, you know, get as little of sleep as possible, work 15 hour days, do diet. So everything about being deploying was completely counter to me trying to get a successful IVF treatment, which I found very frustrating because not only was the military not supporting it, it felt like they were going out of their way to sabotage me doing it on my own. Um, so the moving uh, continuity of care, I moved four times in four years, and that was five different clinics in four different states. Every single time I went to a different clinic, I had to go through all the rounds of stuff that they required for their clinic. They wouldn't take what I had done at another clinic. 
And then some of the clinics within six months, if you didn't have a treatment, they would make you redo some of those tests all over again, which drove the costs up something horrible. Because I moved and had to relocate, which is one of the downfalls of being military, we had to transfer our embryos from one clinic to another clinic. And in that trans, uh, transportation, we actually lost the embryos. They were damaged. The, they weren't packaged correctly. And there was no compensation by the shipping company, by the, the company that sent it. They, the embryologist was like, you know, we forgot to put the lid. It happens. Um, and that was absolutely devastating. And there was nowhere for me to turn. And I had to start all over again. Um, the emotional impact of this, which is pretty obvious, but I'm going to touch on it anyway, because I'm physically taking drugs that impact my emotions on top of just the emotional impact of doing this treatment anyway. Now, I'm being forced to go to work, so I find out about my embryos being destroyed or having a miscarriage and the transfer not taking while I'm at work. Um, because of having to endure that, it is impossible for anyone not to have some kind of emotional reaction to that. Um, I was told that I lacked emotional control and poise because I didn't take that news well. Um, and uh, they went on to justify lowering my performance marks because I lacked that emotional control and poise. And it was the same, IVF was the same as getting a DUI for justification in lowering my marks, which went on to impact my promotion and I was mandatorily uh, retired. Um, medical weight advance. So for medical weight advance, there are three things that you have a medical weight advance that is currently granted, a thyroid, steroid, and PCOS. I have two of the three things. I take steroids for PCO or steroids for the IVF treatments, and then I have the medical condition, PCOS. And yet the medical weight advance was denied um, because they considered the IVF elective. And you gain weight. Uh, I'd gained 30 to 40 pounds. I still had a job to do. I still had to make my weight requirements. And I tried to work around scheduling when I had that because we'd have April and October weigh-ins. But it became really difficult um, because a lot of it depended on when the clinics had available. Sometimes they'd close the clinics. There'd be holidays. A doctor would be out. And so I was at the mercy of those. And at this point, at my age, I didn't have time. I just went for it. Um, but that did cause me to butt up against the medical weight advance and their issues of not taking into account women that were going through pre-treatment. So when we're, once I'm pregnant and after I'm pregnant, that stuff is covered. Um, but while I'm trying to get pregnant and it, the effects that that has on both physically and emotionally was not being taken into account. Um, the time. So time, it took months to get paperwork done. Uh, and I told you about the tests and having to have to do stuff over again. Um, there was months for a prep cycle and it's amazing to me how much people do not understand what goes into an IVF cycle. Um, I had a boss tell me to just reschedule it next week and I'm in the middle of a retrieval and I'm like, this isn't like a dental cleaning. Like we've been doing this for days you're like weeks. Like I can't just put it off till next week. That's not how this works. And it was um, very frustrating that there was a lack of understanding as to what goes into this. Uh, process and what requirements um, are on the individual. Uh, so the, the last point is the inconsistency. So when I was 38 years old and active duty and I had a better chance of getting pregnant, I had no help whatsoever. When I retired at 42 and my PCOS was deemed as service related, I was afforded up to six IVF treatments. So let that sink in for a second. If I'm actively serving my country, I can't get the help. But if I get out, I can deem it service related. I can get up to six treatments, which would be about $120,000 if you're doing it by 20,000. So there's a huge incentive for people to get out in order to get the medical care. And here we are having issues about maintaining um, retention of women, especially in the military. And here's a disparity that you know, motivates folks to get out if they're having these medical issues. Um, we have a diversity inclusion plan and a human capital strategy plan that was very clear that I could have a career and a family. But then when I tried to do that, having a having a family cost me my career. And it was, um, you know, the cultural understanding of, well, if you're supposed to have kids, they'd be in your sea bag. And comments like that, although not obviously accurate and true, <laughs> still were being Said, which is horrible. Um, there's also inconsistencies with the, the services, the DOD versus DHS. Um, and uh, one of the issues that came up with the VA was, well, were you exposed to burn pits? Were you overseas? Yes, actually, I, I did go overseas. 
but I'm an emergency response person in house. We had ships catch fire and methyl ethyl death and hurricanes and stuff that there was exposures right here in the United States. I didn't need to go overseas in order to get exposed to something, but the policy was specifically tailored towards me being deployed somewhere overseas. And I would, I would say that we can be deployed in house and we have emergencies and, and stuff that we can get exposed to on a regular basis right here. We don't have to go overseas to do that. And that was something that I found very frustrating. Um, and it took me, when I retired 10 months to pick up my treatment from when I was uh, active duty to when I finally got to start the IVF rounds again. So 10 months worth of time, time is of the essence. I'm definitely not getting any younger. And if I had cancer and I was dealing with it on active duty and I retired, would it take me 10 months to get my cancer treatments picked back up again? It, you know, like to me, it's the time that it takes to process the paperwork is ridiculous. It should not be taking this long. It's been a fight um, my entire time, whether I was active duty or once I retired. And it was very, very frustrating. And I can see how people would um, get up, uh, give up because it's not something that is uh, supported. And uh, it's an uphill battle the whole way. Wow, Carrie, thank you so much for sharing. You clearly um, put a lot of thought into those remarks. It's an incredible story. You you took us, you took 10 minutes, but you took us through months and years of heartache and um, my heart just goes out to you and I appreciate you being here today and sharing with us. Um, Ryan, I'm going to turn to you. Uh, we have been working together uh, for many years. You have been working on this issue, thinking about Carrie and all of her barriers and I know you have, you have had such passion for making this far easier and far better, certainly for our veterans as well. So tell us a little bit about, um, from your perspective, where you sit, what the barriers are, and also what are the policy changes that Senator Murray and others are advocating for to fix this? Great. Thanks, Barb. And um, sorry to be a second laid. IT works flawlessly every time except when you need it to. So nonetheless, here we are. Um, great yeah, great to we, have you. Great to see you. You're right on time. <laughs> um, so yeah, we've been working on this for close to a decade now. Um, Senator Murray has been really advocating for the Women, Veterans and Families Health Services Act. Um, this Congress, that's S319. Um, what we're trying to address a number of um, the barriers and I, I think Carla did a great job outlining what so many of those are and, and Carrie also. Um, you know, where our legislation looks at both the DOD side of the house and at the VA side of the house. And the, the barriers are somewhat different. We're trying to take take them all on her in, in whatever we can. Um, we we've been pushing this for a number of years. Um, we have had only some moderate success so far. What we've been able to do is force a, a workaround essentially through the appropriations process where VA has some ability to provide IVF and ART, um, but it's tied to the money that we give them every year in the appropriations bill. So for some reason, the, you know, that wasn't carried one year, we quickly run into a situation where VA wouldn't be able to provide that anymore. What we need is a permanent policy framework that really builds this into the structure of US code to, to make these changes permanent. And you, depending how next week goes, you know, we're hoping that we're gonna be able to really come aggressively um, and push this really hard next Congress. So um, some of the things that we're looking at in terms of especially changes from the, the bill that we have already is addressing, you know, addressing a lot of the things that, that Carla talked about. Our legislation, um, would get rid of the requirement um, that that service members be able, or veterans be able to provide their own genetic material. We would start authorizing donors. It would be agnostic in terms of marital status. Um, you know, we're looking right now at adding, and this was you know this is going to be new for for next Congress how to do this. Um, we're looking at adding some sort of presumptive for service connection for infertility for this specific service. You, you start getting into a really big conversation um, when you talk about service connections in the VA context, but um, 
because it's so hard often to prove um, where it came from, we're going to start, we want VA to start with the assumption that this is a result of, of service and just get people the care that they need. Um, so we're looking at that right now. We're also looking at the approval process and what it takes to actually get into and get approved for care, especially from VA. And we've heard a number of stories, obviously very interested if folks um, are having the same experience uh, of just the, the internal bureaucratic process of getting, getting a couple approved for care, taking months, having to go all the way up to VA central office. There's no reason that needs to happen. Um, you know, we're also working through how is this going to integrate with the new community care process. Um, you know, we're having some disparities, I think, between how uh, some of the the third party administrators are working and and working with families to um, get them into the care that they need, get their providers into the network. Uh, we want to make sure that that's a consistent experience across the system, and that would hopefully address some of these coordination of care issues. Um, the you know if if you move if whether it's PCS whether you know you're you're relocating um, for any other reason as a veteran um, you don't have to go through some of those same things VA's prides itself on having such a large integrated health system and having the ability to to transfer a lot of those records a lot of the tests things like that are. A major selling point for their system that needs to transfer over into into this care also. Um, so that's hopefully where we're headed for for next Congress. Like I said, um, the the version of the authority that we have in place right now is very limited. Um, it mirrors precisely what's in the DoD policy, uh, and that was purely a function of the the really difficult negotiation process we had to go through go through with um, you know the house with all sides of the appropriations committee to be able to get some kind of agreement to get this interim fix done what we what we want to see happen is get this comprehensive policy framework that we outline in our legislation finally passed into law so and I just want thank you Ryan um, I just want to add to that that appropriation fix, um, became effective in January of 2017. And so um, that's just been in the last uh, few years that the VA has been offering um, IVF in that limited manner. Um, let's bring in Dr. Ryan because um, Dr. Ryan, you're a reproductive endocrinologist. What you do is you help people build their families and you've really been on the front lines. You've been um, helping veterans. You've been dealing with this new um, opportunity for veterans to access care um, through the VA health system. And I'd love for you to share, if you can, um, some of your experiences in, in helping your patients. Sure, thank you so much, Barb. Thanks for the opportunity to be part of this forum. Um, I'm really inspired to hear that veterans' voices are being heard and to hear that, you know, to hear Ryan and Carla talk about a, a pretty sophisticated understanding of the barriers that are out there that I have you know, seen firsthand in helping um, veterans navigate the system to get the care they need. And, uh, and again, thank you, Carrie, that I'm um, so, so sorry to hear about um, everything you've been through to, as you worked hard to kind of, to try to get the care you needed. Um, so as Barb said in my introduction, I'm now at the University of Washington where I'm the division chief for reproductive endocrinology and infertility. That is the um, subspecialty that cares for uh, women with, with infertility. I'll be working at the Puget Sound VA part-time in the new year, but I've had the pleasure for the last six years um, of being part of the Iowa City VA healthcare system and part of their research um, center of innovation as well. And I've been able to um, work with VA central office a little bit as well on this issue. Um, uh, part of my work also integrates really well, my research work integrates well with this question of what is it about military service um, that may put male, male and female veterans at higher risk for infertility. So we're just finishing up a six year study um, looking at that very thing. What is the accurate um, prevalence of infertility in for veterans um, and what kind of associations are there 
with their military exposures, their combat trauma, um, and sexual assault trauma. So we're helping to um, helping to try to elucidate that question. Um, but I'm so pleased to hear that this new bill would include an assumption um, that service can be associated with infertility because as has been brought up earlier, the science is just not there yet, um, even in our you know, expert world to be able to make this connection um, all the time when, when we should be able to do that. Um, so from my perspective um, on, on being in the system, um, I would say that barriers include in, and start with a system that was really not set, to, set up to care for women and families and couples. And infertility is really a couple's disease. And so that I think is the beginning of the, of the complexity of trying to navigate a system and, and access care. Um, it also includes, there's actually quite an, a lack of awareness um, from, on the part of veterans and on the part of staff and healthcare providers within the system that there is any infertility care coverage, um, let alone the IVF coverage that's been available since 2017. So, um, Time and time again, I talked to veterans and they said I had no, you know, I had no idea that I could even think to go to the VA for this kind of care. Um, and then the, the access issues continue um, again with these limitations on coverage. Um, the medical benefits package has fairly decent coverage once people have found out um, somehow through the grapevine that, that that's there for them, but again, doesn't cover the non-veteran spouse. And then as Carla um, beautifully um, described the issues uh, with the IVF coverage um, and those limitations, which are you know, frankly inequitable. Um, and then again, there's this burdensome expectation um, of, to try to make this connection with a service connected disability and how could that create infertility and has been brought up recently, you know, beforehand again with unexplained infertility, that can be difficult or people if they hadn't sought care during their service for some of their reproductive health issues as women may not be encouraged to do, we then don't have that service connected disability to make that connection with infertility either. So that can become a big time um, suck to try to go back and get connected with those things that may, may be associated with their infertility. Um, and then and the expertise is just lacking within the system to make that connection. So too often it has to go up to the VA central office because nobody in the local VA system can, can answer that question, you know. Um, and then trying to send that out to the community where, where private or academic practices out in the community won't take the VA insurance um, because they've had bad experiences in the past with, you know, with trying to navigate that insurance system and not get eventually getting reimbursed. And so they won't see these patients to try to help them make the connection, uh, service connection with their infertility. Dr. Um, Ryan, let me, let me um, bring in a question here and then I'm gonna, um, we're gonna move on a bit, but sure. you bring, you just on that last point, are there reproductive endocrinologists in the VA hospital system, the VA health system that, that provide this care? Um, Basically, uh, no. <laughs> I mean, when I was uh, when I when I um, had my position start at the VI, I was the only one. Um, Alicia Christie, who's the you know deputy director um, of reproductive health services um, with the VA central office, is also a reproductive endocrinologist. But to my understanding, we are the only two. Um, but you're I, not you're not doing IVF in the VA. System. Correct. 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 So I just right. want to exactly. clarify There's that. Very, no, great point. There's very limited um, actual infertility services available through the VA. So it, it does require going outside, um, going outside, of, you know, navigating a system to go outside to okay. providers okay. in the community. We're going to come back to you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Ryan. It's just uh, it's just such an honor to have you here. I know you've done so much work in this area. Sarah, I'm going to bring you into the conversation. Um, what, uh, you know, can you share what the House Committee on Veterans Affairs is doing about these barriers to accessing care for our veterans? Yeah, um, thank you so much. A lot, um, sort of the work the last Congress has been a little bit twofold, really. Part, the first is the oversight of implementing this program since it's since 2017 and trying to see the ways in which they have eased out what was a pretty rough uh, unfolding in the beginning. Um, you know, there we worked with veterans where it wasn't uncommon to wait up to eight months for contracts to get signed. And that sort of 
the, what was mentioned, that sort of triangle of death between VA, TriWest, and the fertility clinics. And for VA, they were creating a program out of, in a way that they never had to before, which was treating a spouse. And for fertility clinics, this was a contracting with a federal agency for possibly one patient. Um, so it was a huge undertaking. And I think generally those, those issues have been steamed out. But what's already been mentioned of how is VA communicating to veterans this extremely tight eligibility process? Um, and they are, but it's, it's sort of this devastating realization of it's only 800 people to date have been able to use this program. And we know that the at least genital injuries alone, that there's a need that's much greater than that. So it speaks to then, well, what are these inequities around, you know, these things are harder to, as you're saying, identify in women, they're harder, they're given the rules of the DOD guidance, they're much harder to allow when a veteran doesn't have genetic material to use and VA has a prohibition on donated materials. So all of the sort of strings of which we didn't, these people weren't acknowledged and these people weren't acknowledged um, sort of has been, we've been capturing all of that this last Congress, um, which then moves us to what, um, at least on the House side, Ms. Chairwoman Brownlee, the, she's the chairwoman of the health subcommittee has sponsored a bill this year that would um, make IVF part or infertility care, including IVF part of healthcare at VA, that it is too difficult to piece out the service connected element, it also isn't fair or reasonable given that these are medical conditions that have a medical treatment and should be treated as such. Um, you know, in the same way that service connection is not, if you're service connected for diabetes or cancer, you still get treated whether or not you, or whether you're not service connected um, with the treatment options that are available. Um, it would also sort of take off that burden of the providers trying to find a way to make this service connected so that families can pursue this. Um, and then take off all of those restrictions we already mentioned about the DOD uh, piece, which is that it denies same-sex couples, it denies single people, it denies people without usable uteruses or, or gametes to donate, um, or those with religious objections to making embryos and want to adopt an embryo. Um, so sort of looking at this as the holistic picture that it is, which is people need care for medical conditions. Um, so that's hopefully we'll be able to get some movement next year. Um, but that's, I think, where we're heading. Yeah, and I love how um, Chairwoman Brownlee has approached the issue in that holistic fashion, because that really comes out in the language in that bill. Um, and so again, that is HR 8034, uh, Veterans Infertility Treatment Act of 2020. Um, well, I, um, I'm going to bring it back to you, Carla, because I know that you, you put this issue brief together. We now see a whole host of problems. Um, and I want to get to some of the questions that people are, are asking. But bottom line, in your issue brief, you come up with some recommendations. What were they? Yeah, so I just want to start off by, I think, reiterating a little that, you know, access to infertility care, it, affects a person's right to make decisions about their reproductive life. It also affects their right to accessible, affordable, and quality health care and to equality and non-discrimination. And I think Carrie's story, you know, is very um, telling of like, you know, all of the barriers that we have identified and how they impact a single person and they impact, you know, the entire military community. And, you know, we hoped that in identifying disparities and barriers to barriers to care, um, that it will help motivate and sort of uh, help policymakers to remove these barriers and to enact laws and policies that facilitate access to care and reduce existing disparities. And to do that, we recommend to Congress and the administration, a lot of the things that have already been brought up by, by Ryan and others um, to take immediate steps, for example, to ensure regular collection and publication of data on infertility incidents and access to care in the military. Um, there's such a gap, a glaring gap of, of, you know, data to better understand the scope of, of infertility incidents in the military. And we think it's critical to disaggregate this data by, for example, race, sex, sexual orientation, and marital status, but also military rank, um, age. I think all of those um, data points are really critical. 
We also obviously recommend that they remove the policy barriers that I um, outlined earlier, including, you know, requiring using your own gametes, um, have, you know, being married, um, and, and, you know, create a more inclusive eligibility list of eligibility requirements that um, makes access to care also possible for people in same-sex partnerships and single people, for example, um, and also to expand the capacity of the DHA and the VHA to ensure a greater number of participating providers with a broader geographic diversity so that it isn't just these little nodes across the country that are physically inaccessible to a lot of people, including to carry. Um, additionally, we, you know, to safeguard everyone's right to quality health care, we recommended to DHA and VHA that they incorporate best practices for infertility care that have already been established by the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, by the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and by the World Health Organization, um, and to issue and implement guidance for infertility care referrals so that we can avoid instances of referrals to limited service providers, um, which is one of the barriers that I identified earlier. These policy recommendations that we make in the issue brief really get at the heart of some of the major barriers that we identified, and if implemented, um, would help to better ensure equitable access to care um, for service members, veterans, and their family. You know, here, here, Carla, excellent job on the issue brief. Um, I was um, really so excited when I read it, and I think you just hit on all the points. Um, how can somebody get their hands on the issue brief? Sure, I think um, someone has posted in the chat a link okay. to the issue brief. It's okay. also on the Center for Reproductive Rights website. So I encourage you to read that issue brief because as somebody who's been working on this, Ryan, I think you said 10 years, you know, um, I read it and I felt like, wow, you you just mapped it all out and you, you got it all there. So this is a, an excellent um, summary of um, and, and detail of the problem. And, and I highly recommend you, you read that. I'm gonna mention one more bill that um, includes coverage for, um, military for veterans. It also includes outside of, of federal government and, and plans in the private sector, but it is the Access to Infertility Treatment and Care Act. It's HR 2803 and S 1461. I don't know if somebody can put that in the chat or I'll try and remember. Again, HR 2803 S 1461. That's sponsored by um, Cory Booker and Rosa DeLauro. Um, so we have three bills that in some way, shape or form cover military veterans and, um, and care for, for infertility. So I just wanna encourage you to advocate. If you are on this call and you are working in, uh, a con in, con in Congress, um, please take up this issue, talk to Sarah, talk to Ryan, talk to any of us. And um, we can provide you with your constituents who very much want to see these policies change. Um, if you're an advocacy organization or somebody else who cares about this issue, join us. You uh, can email me. I'm going to have my email at the end and find out how you can advocate um, and, and work alongside us. But I want to pose a question, the first question, and then um, we're going to see what's in the chat. Why, I'm gonna ask Ryan this question, why are we even having this conversation? Can't the VA and the DOD just add coverage? Why do we have to go to Congress? It's a fantastic question. Um, for DOD, a lot of this DOD could do on its own. Um, for VA, there's a little bit of disagreement. There's a 1992 law um, when Congress expanded some VA services to really deal with um, VA making sure that they can serve the, you know, the sort of growing number of women veterans that they were starting to see. And that law, um, though it's not part of U.S. code, it's still statute that says explicitly prohibits things like abortion, um, IVF, um, things like that, which is what we're trying to get around and why we need legislation to, to do this. All right, there you have it. Um, the VA is prohibited from offering IVF, and so we, we must go to Congress. DOD might be able to do some of this. It's a debate we have all the time with TRICARE to determine 
what um, they can and can't do on their own. Um, I don't know if anyone else has has a thought on that, but um, I'm gonna. I know we have questions coming in through the chat. As also, I see questions in the Q and A. Um, I just encourage everybody to move over to the chat. That's what's being monitored. Um, and, and you ask your questions there. Um, you should be able to see a little button that says more, and then there'll be a, a link to the chat. Sometimes it's right there on the bottom of your page and you can ask your questions there. So uh, let's jump right in. Um, what are some of the questions we're getting? Um, someone, actually several folks have been asking about how we can get service members and veterans involved in the advocacy process and, and what can volunteers who are civilians do? What are kind of the next steps going forward? Excellent. So um, you now have on your screen everybody's email. Um, I highly recommend that you take a picture of this or, or write our names down because again, we are all uh, willing to speak with you. Um, everybody obviously gave their permission to put their email here. Um, for, for anyone who wants to advocate, um, you can contact me, bcolora at resolve.org. Um, if you are at all um, involved with any of the veteran service organizations, the VSOs, they are also very involved with us in this issue. So Paralyzed Veterans of America, Wounded Warrior Project, um, Disabled American Veterans, IAVA. Um, if, you, if you feel more comfortable going right to those organizations, you can do so. It'll eventually um, end up probably back at me or back at Sarah or Ryan. Um, but um, otherwise, if you're not um, affiliated with any of those organizations, reach out to me at Resolve. Um, we do um, a federal advocacy day. We had about 400 people this year, but we do things like this briefing and we work on this issue very closely with the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Our two organizations um, work on this and uh, we wanna get this done. We need your voice, we need your help. What else? Um, can you speak a little bit more about the connections you see between mental health and infertility care and what can we do to support folks through this process? I'm gonna ask Dr. Ryan um, to answer that one. Yeah, that, that's a great question. I mean, it, it's kind of multi-layered, I would say. Um, we know that there are, um, you know, uh, impacts of, of infertility um, when it when it comes to things like depression and anxiety, um, and then we we also uh, are thinking about how do we support veterans through that, and then also how do we look at any connections where a mental health disorder might be associated with their service and then that therefore is connected and, and provides that service connection. Um, so that comes up most often I would say when it comes to PTSD. Um, and so and one of the things that we're seeing in our research is is a fairly consistent association between PTSD and higher rates of infertility. Um, we just uh, we also did a study looking at there's a an assess a quality of life, life assessment tool called the Fertiqual. Um, that assesses fertility related quality of life. And we showed that in veterans with infertility and PTSD, they had um, much lower scores on that vertical. Um, so I think that these things are all interact in a very important way. And it's particularly important that veterans have mental health um, support, um, you know, both to try to potentially prevent infertility. Um, you know, we can't make that direct association at this point, but also to support them in their infertility journey. Yeah, and um, for those of you who are not in this space day in and day out like we are here at Resolve, this is actually why Resolve was founded over 40 some years ago, is that um, emotional impact of infertility. So, you know, peel out the, um, the veteran, the military, infertility in and of itself, um, it, it is, is a very trying um, journey. And, and there's study after study after study of the linkage between um, your mental health um, and, and not that it causes the infertility, but how the infertility is impacting your mental health. And that's why we have support groups and we do a tremendous amount in this area. So there is um, tremendous um, linkage between the two. And as Dr. Ryan said, even more layers for um, our military and veterans. Freya, what, what 
Go ahead. Can I just add one other thing? Is that I think this connection between mental Carly. health. And, yeah. Can, oh, can you hear me? Yes. Go right ahead, please. Okay. I think it's really critical, and I'm I'm glad that the question was raised about mental the connection between mental health and infertility care because something we haven't talked about in this briefing is is how um, stigmatized infertility is and how it can be so um, isolating and really have a negative personal impact on your personal life expectations and how you know, it's really an invisible loss for people who are involuntarily childless, um, who, who want to have a child and, and, and cannot access the care that they need in order to have a child. And I really, I think um, it, it just, it, it, it carries a lot of personal shame, um, really unfortunately, because there is no need to, to feel shame about it. Um, you know, as, as a queer person in a same-sex partnership, I, I try to share that with, on, you know, on any panel that I'm on or in conversations, because I think it's really important to normalize this, whether it's clinical or social infertility. At the end of the day, we need, you know, medical intervention to become pregnant, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. And so, you know, connecting the mental health to the infertility care is really important, and I think they go hand in hand. Fantastic. Well said. Um, all right, next question. Um, so we've talked a lot about DOD and VA, and folks are wondering about the Coast Guard. Uh, the Coast Guard is often left out of um, or provided reduced coverage as compared to other components of the DOD um, since they fall under DHS. So is does the legislation that we've just talked about include DHS, and how can we make sure that um, everyone in the Coast Guard also will benefit from these changes? So we're talking um, about people that are currently in the Coast Guard and um, so, so not necessarily retired yet. And I'm gonna open the phones up to both Carrie, Ryan, uh, Ginny, anybody who might be able to answer that. Uh, well, I can speak upon the fact that I had a lot of issues specifically with getting access to care um, because we were out DHS and it was a, a DOD, the facilities are DOD. So trying to get stationed near one of them, there is no, that was part of one of the challenges. Um, and it is an issue with a lot of the verbiage of policies coming out where it doesn't specifically say DHS. And I understand higher up, they're different entities, but DOD and DHS service members both need to be represented in policies moving forward. Carrie, thank you. Questions, next question. Um, we haven't talked much about surrogacy and folks would love to hear more about plans to include that in the next session's legislative priorities. Yeah, um, you know, not to steal anyone's thunder, but this is um, this is a big problem. We've mentioned that um, the current policy at DOD and at uh, the v that the VA picked up does not even allow the use of donor sperm um, or donor egg or surrogacy. Um, Sarah, the the bill that you talked about, HR 8034, that does um, remind me that does include coverage for surrogacy, correct? Yes, it does. Um, and then I'd only to add more to the crazy is that donor sperm is allowed if you're doing IUI at VA, but not if you're doing IVF. So, right. What yeah. is the, yeah, it's almost like somebody wrote some of these policies that didn't understand the medical science, right, Dr. Ryan? Um, so, <laughs> yeah. So yes, um, the Veterans and Fertility Treatment Act does. Um, Ryan, um, the Women Veterans and Families Health Services Act, does it include anything related to third party surrogacy, donor egg, donor sperm? It would explicitly allow donors surrogacy, although it does absolutely cover that. So it would cover surrogacy, donor egg, and donor sperm. So the, the legislation, um, both of those bills do. And sorry, can I add a little bit more? more? Go ahead, Carla, go not, right ahead. Not necessarily on surrogacy, but because Sarah brought up IUI, and I, I think I saw a question about IUI in the chat, just to note that, you know, IUI is, is far less expensive than IVF if you go and um, pay out of pocket, but it does run into the thousands of dollars. Um, and just like with IVF, multiple rounds are often required in order to achieve a, a pregnancy. So, you know, the, the issue of um, barriers based on income are real, whether you're looking to do IUI or IVF out of pocket or, you know, without insurance. Um, so just to also raise that. 
and and for many people, uh, IUI is not indicated. That's not going to be the, um, the the medical treatment that your physician is going to recommend. Next question. Given how expensive IVF services are, um, how do we offer IVF in a cost-effective manner? Because right now it's just cost prohibitive. So I'm going to um, just shoot to Dr. Ryan, but I just want to say too that at Resolve. Um, we, we actually don't think that IVF is expensive. The reason being is that you are having to pay out of pocket. If we all knew what a, what a hip replacement costs or even a cesarean section, you would be like, oh my goodness, why is this so expensive? Um, because you would be paying for that all out of pocket. So um, that's why so many people react to costs of IVF because they are seeing it and paying every single penny of that medical care, which for most of us, if you go outside and break your arm and you get taken to the hospital and you have to pay all of that out of pocket, you're gonna say to yourself, that was really expensive. Um, having said that, um, there's certainly other ways to build your family that aren't necessarily IVF, but Dr. Ryan, do you have anything else you want to add about the cost and how, um, how costs can be managed in doing IVF? Yeah, thanks, Barb. I, I completely agree with you on the issue of, um, you know, IVF is a complex and um, pretty technologically uh, sophisticated um, uh, treatment. And so I would agree that I think that it looks expensive because it's being paid for out of pocket. Um, you know, I, I just, a friend just posted and saying, saying that they saw a $7,000 bill for their child to go into the emergency room and have a nosebleed cauterized. So, uh, you mean, you're absolutely right that there are a lot of, a lot of medical treatment out there is, is very expensive and, but you just don't see it because your insurance company will pay for it. On the other hand, we should still always be as providers and clinics making sure that we're not charging extra money, that we're doing everything that we can. We're not allowing, you know, overly technologically, um, you know, high tech expensive treatments when they're not proven and they just end up, you know, paying, costing that much more money for our patients. So we should always be making sure we're providing our care in an efficient, cost effective um, way. But the overall message I think is yours, Barb, that this is a, you know, that we do work towards doing that. And it, it is just the problem is it's not covered. Um, I just want to add, we're going to stay on for about three more minutes. If your question is not answered, uh, you're welcome to email it to me and panelists. Are you okay if I forward uh, those questions to the appropriate person and we get the answers to people? Uh, please don't uh, lose that. We, we definitely want to stay connected. So thank you for that. But we're, we have a couple of uh, couple more minutes. Um, any more questions? Yeah, so just to follow up on that, um, the other side of that cost complaint is that DOD and um, NVA are reluctant to cover it because of the cost. So I'm wondering what we can do about that if there are ways to limit cost. Um, and maybe those are just the things that you've already mentioned. But Yeah, and, and, I, and in, in our advocacy work, um, Resolve does a lot of advocacy work at the state level in getting state legislatures to mandate um, insurance coverage for IVF. You think, you think Congress is hard? Um, try, try working in some of the state legislatures. And so we get asked that question every single day, and we have a lot of data um, about um, how there's just quite honestly, better health outcomes um, for people when, um, when you have coverage um, on, on a host of areas. And I think um, what we're seeing across the country is employers are voluntarily adding this coverage because they want to be family friendly. It's a retention and recruitment tool and um, it's the right thing to do. So when you think about DOD, um, if, and, and DHS, if they want to provide care to people and want to um, retain um, women and want to retain men and people who care about families um, and want to provide care um, for, for everyone on that continuum, as Carla was talking about, this just becomes care that's, that's um, needed and wanted. But we do have actual data that shows um, the cost effectiveness of it. And, um, and we're delighted to continue to share that with offices um, all over Capitol Hill. And we have- I'm, Go ahead, Sarah. 
We do have some anecdotal uh, feedback from VA about how some women veterans that were take, I mean, originally having to pay out of pocket for this benefit were sort of literally putting all their eggs in one basket and doing multiple transfers and having higher risk pregnancies that costed more. Um, and so now if this is, it's a covered benefit, you're doing single embryo transfers, it's safer and cheaper in the long run, but um, the long-term thinking is hard to convince Yeah, people. and there's a, there's a lot of data. Um, in fact, you would find it easier maybe to argue that with, um, with DOD and VA because it's a contained health system versus, um, you know, a private employer that's getting coverage in a variety of ways, because that's exactly right. If you're going to be covering the pregnancy and then the, the birth and, and after covering that IVF cycle up front is gonna save you a great deal um, down the road. Um, any other questions? We all will take one more. Um, there was one kind of clarifying question earlier that I wanted to get back to, which is, um, can we talk a little bit more about folks who have a service related um, case of infertility, but still aren't eligible for coverage? and they are active duty or are they a veteran now? Um, I don't think that okay. was an question, so either case. Okay, so they have a service-connected injury or illness that has caused their infertility, but that, was that narrow definition, um, whether it's DOD, VA, because it's the same, as we all know, um, doesn't cover them. My, my view of that is that they won't be able to get coverage. Um, Ginny, Dr. Ryan. Yeah, so I assume that so that would be a, a, a single person um, or basically a, a person or a couple that is either not married um, or does not have their own eggs and sperm, basically access to their own eggs and sperm. So they could still that veteran could still have a service connected disability associated with infertility, but still not get that IVF coverage uh, because of those other things. Um, and, it, and if that person is being told uh, let's say they are in, they are married and they are going to be using their own sperm or egg and they're still being told this. Would you recommend that they maybe appeal that or? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah. And then and and for that that person, if they are, I guess, under the current rules, appropriately being denied. Um, they, wow. The there's actually just... a term there, appropriately being denied. Okay. <laughs> I know. Sorry. Not appropriate. But you know what I mean. In a, in a position where they yes. are unmarried or whatever. I would, right. I just, just to take the opportunity to point out that many, um, there was an effort by ASRM some years ago to encourage progr IVF programs out there to provide discounted services. And so I would, I always encourage those veterans, if they're in that boat, to reach out to, um, to their local regional IVF centers and find out if they do have those right. um, discount programs. We did at the University of Iowa, we're working on that here, um, and many programs do have that. So just a, Great point. A, a good opportunity to mention that. And if you're wondering where those are, you can email me at Resolve, and we can send you to the um, the place on the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, which is that ASRM. They have a listing of, of the practices. Well, I want to thank our panelists, um, Sarah, Carrie, Ryan, Dr. Ryan, Carla. You all um, provided such... Um, amazing factual current information. This is probably the most comprehensive briefing on this topic um, that I've, I've had the pleasure of being a part of. Um, Ryan and Sarah, I hope, I hope um, you agree with that because we've been, we've been through a lot. Um, I also don't want us to view the VA as the bad guys or DOD as the bad guys. Um, a lot of this has been um, uh, policy and and statutory issues. And so um, I've been at hearings where the VA has testified in support of, of being able and wanting to offer IVF. So um, their hands are tied um, in terms of what they're what they're able to do at this point. Um, and we we need to fix um, the coverage certainly at, at, at DOD and DHS. Um, thank you so much for attending and um, reach out if you have any further questions and we look forward to working with you on this issue and um, our panelists and, and all of you, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.